when Pilate heard this, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judge's seat at a place known as the Stone Pavement, which in Aramaic is Gabbatha. It was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about noon. Here is your king, Pilate said to the Jews. But they shouted, take him away, take him away, crucify him. Shall I crucify your king? Pilate asked. We have no king but Caesar, the chief priests answered. Finally, Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified. So the soldiers took charge of Jesus. Carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on each side and Jesus in the middle. Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this sign, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. The chief priests of the Jews protested to Pilate, do not write the King of the Jews, but that this man claimed to be King of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, dividing them into four shares, one for each of them, with the undergarment remaining. This garment was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. Let's not tear it, they said to one another. Let's decide by lot who will get it. This happened that the scripture might be fulfilled, that said, they divided my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. So, this is what the soldiers did. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, Woman, here is your son, and to the disciple here is your mother. From that time on, this later, knowing that everything had now been finished and so that scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. In the silence of Good Friday, when the heavens seem to hold their breath and the earth freezes in anticipation of the sequence of events triggered by an unthinking crowd, we ponder a question that appears as terrifying as it is absurd. What would it be if Jesus had not made the sacrifice for our sins? Let us imagine for a moment a world where this question is not merely a rhetorical device, but a brutal reality. A world in which God became man to share our fate, which does not end at Golgotha, but somewhere on the peripheries of history, unnoticed, undocumented, immortal, only in the hearts of a few lost souls. In such a world, Good Friday would be a day like any other, without silence, without reflection, without space to contemplate the sacrifice that changed the course of history. There would be no talk of forgiveness that transcends human concepts of justice, of love stronger than death, of hope that illuminates the darkest depths. In such a world, it would be easy to lose oneself in a labyrinth of selfishness, violence, and frustration. Yet, although the question of a world without Christ's cross seems abstract, there is no shortage of people in our surroundings for whom this is a daily reality. People who live as if Jesus never died for their sins, without awareness of the sacrifice and without feeling loved despite everything, but we stand in faith that Jesus died for our sins. He erased our guilt once and for all, crossing the boundaries of time and space so that each of us could stand before God, cleansed, free, and loved. This truth, 
unchanging and eternal, should be a source of continual joy and gratitude for us. So, what does Jesus' sacrifice change in our lives? How do we live knowing that our sins have been forgiven, that our future will not bring darkness or emptiness, but is bright and full of hope thanks to Christ? Good Friday reminds us that life does not have to be an endless cycle of self-satisfaction and selfishness. It reminds us that true love requires sacrifice, that true life begins where our self ends. This Good Friday, in the silence of our hearts, let us contemplate how we respond to this love. Is our life a testimony to this sacrifice? Can we love as He loved us? Let this be our challenge, not just for today, but for every day of our lives. May God bless us all.